Well, the first thing, as far as I'm concerned, when fishing uh, chalk stream is that you've, you've got this water clarity. So use that to your advantage. Obviously, you, uh, you turn up, let's say we've just arrived here, there's a hut. The, the sun's currently over here. So from this bank, we've, we've got very good visibility. It's a little bit dappled. We're in and out of light. You can see trees leaning, leaning over. So there's some shade as well. So principally, uh, my, my initial approach is just to have a poke around, see if I can see any fish uh, subsurface, also looking for risers. Um, this isn't what you would call a sort of typical river in that it meanders. It's quite a straight section of river. However, there's still some interesting sort of structure there as far as trout and feeding uh, lies are concerned. For example, you can see some tussock clumps on, on the far bank and off the edge of those, you get this nice little current coming off. A good percentage of when I'm scoping the river looking for fish is always in them areas. I kind of glance the middle of the river and for me, it's, it's ideally the margins I want to be looking at because that's where the food's filtered here on these straight sections and also the, the trout feel safer because they're close to the bank, undercut banks, they're close to reeds and, and grass sort of traipsing in the water. So it's cover that they can bolt into if, if, if they feel threatened. The other features we, we need to be looking for, obviously, certainly on chalk streams, is, is we've got ranunculus weed. And often you get long fronds of this. It's early in the season, it hasn't developed yet. Uh, it's probably been torn out through winter floods and yet yet to re-establish itself. Once we get those lovely long trailing fronds, you, you in effect get corridors between them and they're ideal for fish to sit. Again, depend only when the sun is immediately overhead does it illuminate the whole river bed. When the sun's at an angle, those weed beds cast, cast a shadow and it's often enough for fish to feel comfortable. So that's a prime area we, we need to focus on. Again, we've, we, we'll have boulders here or uh, some uh, sunken logs, uh, tree roots, etc. They're key areas, complex currents welling up off them, stirs up the stream bed, but it also creates a curtain on the surface which trout feel safe under. They're, they're uh, prime areas to sort of study as you, you creep about the riverbank, try to observe and work out where fish might be holding. Again, I just mentioned tr sunken tree roots, but anywhere where a, a tree's actually fallen into the river, they're perfect. You get a, that kicker current we spoke about earlier, just coming off there, and that, that just filters, sucks flies in into that, surface flies, be, be they upwing flies, caddis, or uh, in a month's time, we'll get terrestrials dropping in off the trees. And they, they all get ushered in into these areas. During April, we're middle of April now, uh, it's still quite early season in, in many places and certainly for the chalk streams. The key hatch window for me would be anywhere from uh, 11 a.m. till 3 p.m. Of course, that, that's just a, a, a generalisation. If you've got warmer days, for example, the granum can come off a little bit earlier. However, that I would perceive you, you ideally want to be on the water from 11 to 3. That doesn't mean you won't catch fish outside of that window, that's your best chances of uh, experiencing hatching fly and hopefully rising fish. Well, it becomes a lot more complicated as the season progresses through May and June in that we've obviously got longer days, we've got warmer temperatures, uh, trout will and do tend to feed at lower light levels. We've got to remember as well, many, many of the fly species, caddis and, and upwings, prefer uh, cloudy days for example because they're, they're, they're obscured to predators, aerial predators like swallows and swifts and black-headed gulls so they, they prefer low light levels and again it's not unusual uh, we've had really dry sunny spells uh, once you get a prolonged spell of this, this weather to see the actual upwing flies that we would typically expect to see hatching through the day i.e. your large dark olives your iron blues, your olive uprights, all are, all are present in May. Whilst we would generally expect to see them hatching through the daytime, if you've got a, a, a weather trend of sunny weather, they'll revise that and hatch in the evening time, or first thing in the morning as well. But the evening time's probably your best window then. So the early part of the hatch for me is the best. Fish have obviously come out. What, what, we, what a lot of people tend to forget, and especially beginners, is that uh, they think fish stay on station 24 7 
So you've got, uh, I guess in, in, in uh, fly fishing terms, we've got three types of lie. You've got your prime lie, where fish will find shelter and food in one lie. They're very, very rare and transient, in my opinion. You've got feeding lies and you've got resting lies. Now, resting lies might be a communal sort of thing under an undercut bank or a deep section of water protected by boulders. You might get several fish resting together. Then in the feeding lies, these, these fish will sort of disperse and each take up station on a feeding lie. What you've got to remember with feeding lies is trout can be quite vulnerable. They tend to be in shallow water, fish are close to the surface and, and they can be predated on from cormorants, from ospreys, otters, all those kind of things. So, so they're very aware that they're taking a, a, a risk when they're going out to feed. So what will happen on the front end of the arch, that, that's really where I, I like to be because the fish have just come out onto feeding station, they're keen, they're hungry, they're looking for food. Usually they'll prepare to move that little bit further to intercept a fly, whether that's a, a natural or uh, your best efforts when you're casting at the fish. Once the hatch builds up, it can be exciting because you can get a lot of fly littered on the surface. Fish can become that little bit more picky in them circumstances. Not always, if you get a light hatch, they'll feed and be grateful right through the hatch. But if you get, if, if, if we're blessed, if you want to call it blessed with those dense hatches, fish will just become that little bit more choosy. And then on the back end of the hatch, again, it's not my favorite time. I like the anticipation and the build up. That doesn't mean to say you won't catch fish, you will. But again, they've, they've, they've probably had the fill and there'll be one or two fish mopping up for sure, but maybe they're just not quite prepared to move so far to intercept a fly. So obviously we all get, um, the, the heart skips a beat when we see a rise, you, you know, a yippee, great, I found one, a riser. It's easy to rush in. I kind of draw breath, count to three, count to 10 rule, whatever works for you. And just observe, observe the fish initially, see if I can identify what it's feeding on. Obviously it's a question of elimination by that. I mean, let's assume there's large dark olive duns on the surface and we see the, the actual dun, the adult dun go over the fish and it doesn't intercept them. Very good chance it's eating the emerging stage, which is virtually invisible to our eye because the flush in the surface film. So then we'd look to choose an emerger. I'll also observe how far the fish is pre prepared to move from where we perceive the lie is. Will it move two foot to the left? Is it left-handed or right-handed as I call it? Does it prefer to feed to the left? Does it prefer to feed to the right? These are the things we need to be looking for so then we, we know where to deliver the fly. Because again, as a, as a generalization, them, them first few casts make them count. They're usually the ones that fool the fish. That doesn't mean to say the fish isn't going to eat after the hundredth cast, but generally speaking in my book and certainly with wild fish those initial casts are your best opportunity. Gauging how far to, to uh, land the fly in front of a fish is it can be a little bit more complex. What you've got to remember the fish has got a window of 97.5 degrees. Let's just simplify that by a few degrees and knock that back to 90 degrees. So when the fish is sat in the in the water it's got this 90 degree window. So a fish lying in four foot of water as opposed to a fish in two foot of water has a greater window of vision. So consequently, we've got to land the fly further upstream. Of course, we can't, <laughs> we can't go out there with a tape measure and go, mm, oh yeah, it's in three foot of water, it's in five foot of water. We've just got to use past experience and just try and look at the substrate, hence why, why the Polaroids are always here, and, and roughly gauge w what depth of water you think the fish is lying in. Obviously a fish in four foot of water, I'd, I'd be looking to land the fly six foot ahead of that, five foot maybe. Again, you don't want to go too far because the further you land the fly up, yes, the fish doesn't sense anything, but the more likelihood the fly has of dragging as it gets close to the fish because your line and fly have been on the surface for an appreciable amount of time now. So fish close up to the surface, consequently have got quite a small window of vision, we can land the fly a lot closer or a lot nearer to the fish. But be aware now, obviously, if it's plopping in quite hard, this can alert the fish as well. Striking fish. Yep, generally smaller fish, um, obviously the, the shorter in length. So when they rise, they're quick to turn down. So my advice is with small splashy rises is, is to set the hook immediately. 
larger fish tend to be they're almost like articulated lorries as I liken it to going round a, a roundabout it's slow languid you know and they'll tilt up eat like that and you see this kind of thing you can be too quick to set the hook on them I know this to my peril of course so you just want the head when the head say let surface is here head comes up you just want that head to disappear, you see the body rock, and that's the time to tighten. I prefer the word tighten rather than strike, but again, that, that's easy said in the heat of the moment, we can all have a bit of a knee, knee jerk. So generally, yeah, uh, <clears throat> first thing is wet your hands, obviously, where we want to protect that uh, slime layer that fish have that in essence protects them from disease. It's a protective sort of mucus around them. Um, so wet your hands, net the fish, Often fish flap about quite a lot and people again can just tighten up, just be as gentle as you can. A good tip is actually for a moment turn the fish upside down when you unhook it and this kind of disorientates the fish for, for a few moments and generally they will lie still. Just enough time for you to slip the hook out, right the fish and, and send it on its way. But the biggest advice I would give is again uh, digressing as a Vice President of the Wild Trout Trust and Salmon and Trout Conservation is, is to uh, just minimise having the fish out of the water and keep them close to the water and over the water in the net rather than bringing them out up onto the grassy bank etc etc.